Great. So good morning or good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to the panel Influencing for Change. Um, thanks for joining us. You've made a really great choice. This is the most exciting panel. Um, my name is Fiona York. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I am the Executive Officer of Housing for the Aged Action Group. So I will be the convener of this discussion. Um, and I would say anyone can put comments in the chat um, and just keep it respectful. We can ask questions of the panelists as well. So I'd like to start by thanking Auntie Georgina Nicholson for her great welcome to country earlier today. And also to acknowledge that um, we are on, I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and I pay my respect to the traditional owners of the lands across the country. Um, sovereignty was never ceded and there's been a long and tireless campaign for, from Aboriginal activists for a long, long time. And I pay my respects to all of those activists and leaders given that this is about fighting for change and fighting for justice. So I think it's important to acknowledge that that fight for treaty continues. Um, today, we are lucky enough to be joined by four incredible campaigners to tell us about their successful advocacy campaigns, um, what they've learnt along the way, what worked and what didn't work, and what we, the audience, can take away for our own collective work towards housing justice. Um, so now I'm going to introduce our panellists. So first of all, uh, we have Kirsten Dean. Maybe give us a wave, Kirsten, for anyone that's still on, on Brady Bunch View. Um, Kirsten is the general manager of the Melbourne Disability Institute, and she was the campaign director for the Every Australian Counts campaign, which was the grassroots campaign that fought for the introduction of the NDIS, the National Disability Insurance Scheme. With her ability to bring people together and her clear communication skills, Kirsten played a critical role in building political and public support for this world leading reform. Since then, she's continued to push for NDIS to achieve its original vision. Kirsten has served on numerous ministerial councils and advisory committees, including co-chair and deputy chair of the National People with a Disability and Carer Council. And as a former journalist turned academic, Kirsten has three children. And as a result, she has excellent conflict mediation skills. I'd also like to introduce Kate Colvin. Kate, do you want to give us a wave? Kate is the national spokesperson for the Everybody's Home campaign, the national campaign to end homelessness and fix the broken housing system. She's also the deputy CEO of the Council to Homeless Persons, which is the peak body for the homelessness sector in Victoria. Kate has worked in senior leadership and advocacy roles in community organisations for the last 25 years, and she has played a key role in the development and leadership of other housing campaigns, including Australians for Affordable Housing and the Vote Home campaign. I'd also like to introduce Anna Brown. Anna is the CEO of Equality Australia, and she has been involved in nearly every major reform for LGBTIQ plus people in recent years. She played a critical role in the campaign for marriage equality, co-chairing the equality campaign and running the challenge to the postal plebiscite in the High Court. Anna has been instrumental in hard fought battles to secure federal LGBTI discrimination protections, remove discriminatory laws across the country and right historical wrongs by establishing schemes to erase historical homosexual offences. And lastly, we have Alastair Webb, who, Alastair, do you wanna give us a wave? He is a lawyer and a social and public policy expert with extensive experience across government, the community, not-for-profit and philanthropic sectors. Recently, he was the campaign director for the Building Better Homes campaign, which successfully advocated for the inclusion of mandatory minimum accessibility standards to be included in the National Construction Code. So welcome, everybody. Um, and thank you so much for joining today's discussions. We're really looking forward to hearing about your experience and your reflections um, and hearing about what worked and didn't work for your campaigns. So first of all, I'm going to ask each of our speakers to spend five minutes describing their campaigns. Um, so first of all, we'll start with Kate. Kate Colvin, would you like to go first? Thanks, Fiona. Thanks for having me. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining from Wurundjeri country and pay respect to elders past and present. Um, so as Fiona said, um, uh, Everybody's Home is a national campaign to end homelessness and fix the housing crisis. So um, we started in 2018. Um, we have more than 500 
organisational uh, members and over 35,000 community supporters. And um, the campaign was created um, by housing and homelessness organisations for two major reasons. So the first one was that over the years, there's been lots of behind the scenes lobbying um, by um, housing and homelessness organisations, um, lots of policy work. There's, you know, you could build a mountain out of the number of policy reports that have been built, that have been written, um, arguing that social housing is needed to end homelessness. Um, and yet no, um, not enough progress was being made. So housing and homelessness organisations came together and concluded that what we need is to really build and demonstrate public support for more investment in social housing. So that's where Everybody's Home was created or why Everybody's Home was created. The other reason it was created was because there's lots of little mini campaigns being run by the sector, all with sort of conflicting messages, different branding, and it gets confusing for government and makes it easier to discount what the sector's saying. So Everybody's Home was created to be that single brand with a single set of clear messages that a, a large number of organisations signed on to. So what I want to do, um, that's just sort of really brief outline of the campaign, but what I want to do um, in this five minutes is share with you two things that I've learned working in campaigns for a number of years. And the first one is that you need a really clear campaign goal and you need to have tangible, achievable outcomes to focus your efforts along the way. Because one of the things that's always a risk when you're doing campaigning is that you've got like sort of 20 goals, 20 things that you want to achieve, and you can keep very busy doing lots of little activity that contributes to all of those goals. But because it's um, a dispersed sort of set of activity, it doesn't really make progress, enough progress on any of them. So I want to give you an example of what we did recently of setting a clear um, campaign goal along the way. So um, as uh, we, we heard in the political panel at the beginning of this year, there was all of that hullabaloo about women's safety. And we knew that the government really needed to demonstrate that they were serious about women's safety. They called the National Women's Safety Summit. And we felt like um, that that was gonna be an opportunity where they were definitely going to um, end up spending money to um, show that they were serious about women's safety. And as it happens, housing is really critical to women's safety because domestic and family violence is the biggest driver of women's homelessness. So um, that gave us a strategic um, opportunity to intervene. So what we did is we set um, a micro goal for, the, for a few months work. We, we said what we wanna happen is to have um, housing uh, achieve as an outcome um, in the process around the Women's Safety Summit. So um, to, to make that happen, we were able to direct a set of activity that was all pointed to that end. So we published some research and got media around the fact that um, housing is a really important issue for women's safety. We um, organised an event to galvanise the participants in the National Safety Summit so that they would be active within the event. And we created a sign-on letter that um, 240 organisations signed to demonstrate power and to create a fresh um, opportunity for the media so we could keep the conversation going in the media and also had a petition that was also about demonstrating power. And so what, um, what we were able to achieve was that Housing was included prominently in the delegate statement for the um, housing and for the safety summit. And also we had quite a lot of media attention in the lead in. So we created a public narrative about housing being really critical to women's safety. And that meant that then journalists were asking the minister, well, what are you doing about housing? Because housing is really important. And that brings me to the second thing that I think is something that I've learned along the way. And it was um, words from a very wise public servant who was telling us about what we need to do um, to achieve change. And she said, um, look, you've got to understand that decision makers aren't really interested in your problems. We see 
people come to MPs or, I mean, come to the minister all the time saying, we've got this problem, we've got that problem, we want you to fix it. She said, they're really only interested in fixing their own problems. So what does this mean for our campaign? So for example, if we go and tell decision makers quietly in a room how awful homelessness is for older women and ask them to fix it, we're really sharing our problem. But if instead of that, we um, make the issue a public problem, for example, if hundreds of older women all go to parliament together um, and um, to demand action and demonstrate and get that issue up in the, in the media as a consequence of that combined effort. And then journalists are, are asking the Prime Minister what he's doing to house the mothers and grandmothers of our nation. Then we have a problem for the government and he's gonna to wanna to have a convincing answer to give to that journalist. And so effectively, I think that's the task of our job as campaigners is to make our problem, fixing homelessness for older women, a problem for the government. And that's where I'm going to end it so that you can hear from the other um, wonderful campaigners. Thank you, Kate. That's something to live by. Make our problem their problem. Um, okay, I'm now gonna ask Kirsten to speak about the Every Australian Counts campaign. Thanks, Fiona. Um, and I would also like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land I'm on today, the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects uh, to elders past and present. Um, as Fiona mentioned, I'm now the general manager of the Melbourne Disability Institute. Um, but five minutes ago, um, I was the campaign director for Every Australian Counts. And Every Australian Counts is the campaign that started back in uh, 2011 to fight for the introduction of the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Um, and I actually started uh, work on the campaign back in 2009. There were three organisations in the disability sector that managed to convince two philanthropic trusts to give them a little bit of money um, to start a campaign to see whether this idea for a national disability insurance scheme could actually become a reality. And those three organisations brought me on and said, what would a campaign look like and can you start one? Um, uh, and I'm really struck these days when people talk about the NDIS that they regard it as a bit of an inevitability, like it's such a sensible idea, why didn't it happen before? You know, of course it was always going to happen. Um, and I have to tell you that it did not feel like that um, back in 2009 when we started the campaign. In fact, I spent a lot of nights um, awake worrying that this really good idea would never see the light of day. Um, and the campaign for a national disability insurance scheme faced a whole bunch of uh, challenges um, and collectively I call those challenges uh, the lack. Um, and the first was, was that there was a lack, lack of understanding of the issues that faced people with disability and their families in this uh, country. Um, I think unless you were a person with a disability or like me, a family member of a person with a disability, didn't really understand the kind of challenges that people with disability faced every single day in this country. I think that most people in the public assumed that because we lived in a, you know, liberal democracy and there was some semblance of a social welfare system that somewhere someone was looking after people with disability. And the truth is, is that they weren't. And if there was a lack of understanding of what the issues were for people with a disability and their families, there was even less political will to do anything about it. Disability issues were very, very low down on the kind of political totem pole. There was also a lack of understanding. The NDIS was this really huge, big, uh, complicated uh, social and economic uh, policy, had this funny word insurance in it, and nobody really understood what it was. And not only was it big, and not only was it complicated, it also had a really, really, really big price tag attached to it. Um, and the very people that we thought could help explain this really big complicated idea were people with disability and their families. And they were the very people that we were trying to help. Um, the irony of all of this was not kind of lost on us, which is we were fighting for um, a scheme that was going to give people with disability and their families the support they really needed to go and do the things they would do. And we were fighting for it because they were so strapped for time and for resources. And here we were 
um, asking them to turn themselves into grassroots um, campaigners and giving them something else to do. So we were always really conscious that the very group who we thought would do the best job of explaining why this reform was necessary were the people that needed the most help. Um, and the other thing was, is that this kind of campaign had never been mounted in the disability sector before. We worked with both organisations and individuals who'd never done anything that was even remotely political before. Um, and I think that the kindest thing that we could say about it is that we worked with both organisations and individuals that were kind of quite politically uh, naive. Um, and they hadn't had a chance to do this before. And so we really had to take people kind of on a journey with us. Um, and the final lack, and this is really common to campaigns that are fighting in the progressive areas, that we didn't have any money. We had a little bit of money, but certainly not enough to kind of mount the kind of traditional campaign that you might mount by paying people, um, by paying lobbyists, by running advertising and things like that. All we really had was enough money to resource a very, very small, and I mean very small, uh, campaign team. Um, so they were all of the things that we lacked, um, but we did have one thing in our pocket. Um, what we lacked in resources, we really made up for in people power. There's about 700,000 uh, people who have a severe or profound disability in Australia. And if you multiply that by their families and their friends and people who work in the disability sector, you have a very large group of people um, for whom the issue was really important. What we had to do through the campaign was organise, motivate and resource this really, really large group of people. Um, so I wanted to finish kind of my five minutes with saying, um, from the outside and now people regard Every Australian Counts as a really successful campaign. It didn't feel like that um, in the beginning. It really, really didn't and I really want to emphasise that. It started with a group of people that nobody considered powerful. Um, they had never been listened to. Um, their concerns weren't a priority to anyone. And honestly, in the beginning, um, even people themselves, even people like me wondered if we were really powerful at all. And perhaps individually we weren't, but collectively we were. Um, and collectively, it was this amazing group of ordinary people with a disability and their families who fought for this incredible reform um, and won. And given recent events in the last year, are still fighting for it to deliver on its promise. So I might leave it there and answer some more questions later. Thanks, Kirsten. That was great. Um, Alastair, would you like to tell us about the Building Better Homes campaign? Oh, thanks, Fiona, and thanks everyone for coming along and for having me here today. I'm Alastair Webster, and I'm speaking to you from Wurundjeri Country, and I acknowledge the traditional owners of this country, um, all First Nations people, elders, and any First Nations people that are with us today. As Fiona said, I'm here to talk to you about the Building Better Homes campaign, a campaign to change the National Construction Code and make housing accessible for all Australians. Right now, around three quarters of people with mobility impairment can't find housing that meets their needs. And this includes primarily people with disability and older Australians, but also accessible housing is important for everyone. For families who use prams, for example, and for people who have temporary mobility limitations because of an injury or illness. And demand for accessible housing is only going to get bigger as our population ages and more and more people choose to stay at home rather than go into residential care. And the Royal Commission into Aged Care made that abundantly clear. The point is that every one of us at some stage in our life will need accessible housing. And so the Building Better Homes campaign was established to support, with support from the Summer Foundation, to promote the inclusion of mandatory minimum accessibility standards in, in the National Construction Code. This is a campaign that's been going on for many, many years, long before my time. And I want to acknowledge the work of many, many people, including many people in this room, over a very long time who've been campaigning for changes to the code. But the campaign shifted gear late last year when it was decided that a meeting of building ministers from all the states and territories and the Commonwealth would consider the issue in April of this year. This was a really critical turning point because for the first time the campaign had something to organise around and a clear objective. 
And that objective was to convince a majority of those building ministers to support changes to the code at that meeting. And so we set up the Building Better Homes campaign in November, targeting every building minister in every state. And we had five, min five months to convince them to, to change the code. Early on in the campaign, we took a really deliberate decision to play a very, to take a very under the radar approach. Because we knew if we went out guns blazing, we would only provoke a building industry deeply opposed to the reform that we were pursuing and with very deep pockets to fund a massive campaign against us if they organised and decided to take us on. If they did that and if we provoked them, my fear was that we would lose. So we had to be very strategic. First, we built an evidence base. Work was commissioned through the Melbourne Disability Institute with Bruce and Kirsten to make the intellectual argument for changing the code. And that research found strongly that the benefits of including accessibility standards in the code would far outweigh any cost. Second, we had to build a coalition. We drew together around 80 peak organisations, including disability organisations, seniors organisations like HAG, housing organisations, health and allied health peaks to work with us on the campaign. And these partnerships gave us a reach that we could not have achieved in such a short time. And it gave the campaign a legitimacy despite having only been in existence for a few short months. Third, we lobbied government hard. We met repeatedly with ministers from all the jurisdictions and the Commonwealth. We organised letter writing campaigns from our partner networks. We targeted decision makers on social media. And we built, finally, we built a campaign infrastructure that really drew on the resources of our partner organisations to reach into the key constituencies. Those were people with disability, older Australians, their families and advocates to show those decision makers that this was an issue that mattered to their constituents. And I'm pleased to say we won. On the 30th of April, a majority of building ministers agreed to incorporate mandatory minimum standards into the code. This means that from September next year, for the first time, all new housing will be required to comply with a range of accessibility standards, including step-free access to the house, minimum hallway and door width, step-free shower access, and reinforced walls in the bathroom. This, um, over time, this will mean a really significant increase to the stock of accessible housing, and it will future-proof Australian housing and ensure that people with mobility limitations are not that mobility limitations are not a barrier to fully participating in the community. But despite that win, as is often the case, it didn't end there. It now falls to each state and territory to formally adopt those standards in their jurisdictions. And to date, Victoria, Queensland, Tasmania, the ACT and the NT have agreed to adopt the changes, which is fantastic. And I want to thank the ministers and government in those jurisdictions for doing so. But New South Wales, South Australia and Western Australia have not agreed to adopt the code and will formally opt out of the new National Construction Code by December. So as is the case with many campaigns, one win only leads to the next big fight. Right now, we've turned our attention to convincing those jurisdictions, New South Wales, South Australia and Western Australia to change their position and adopt the code. If they don't, of course, people with disability and older Australians in those jurisdictions will be left worse off than they are in the other states and territories. And that would not be a good outcome for our country. So the campaign continues. And I hope that those of you, particularly those of you in New South Wales, South Australia and Western Australia will join the campaign because we've got three more months to convince those jurisdictions to change the code. Thanks very much. Thank you, Alistair. Um, I'm now going to ask Anna Brown to tell us about the marriage equality campaign. Hi everyone. Well, this one's a bit different from the others. Um, uh, hopefully uh, none of the other campaigns we're talking about need to go through a national vote. Um, and I'm sure everyone on this call remembers where they were when Australians voted yes uh, in November 2017. It really was a once in a lifetime moment and probably the first and 
last time an ABS data release has literally stopped the nation. Um, and before I get into the mechanics, I just was reminded when Tanya was speaking earlier today that how emotional it was. And I remember my now fiance was actually, she'd never met Tanya before, but they found themselves sort of sobbing and hugging um, in each other's arms behind the stage in Sydney's Alfred Park, um, where there was enormous crowds anyway. That's a diversion. I thought it was a, it was a funny memory. Um, but what that campaign really did for LGBTIQ plus Australians was um, really quite profound. And that day itself represented a seismic shift in the way um, Australians view our communities. And uh, when the majority of Australians voted yes, um, what what we what we saw was millions of allies stand up for our community in a way that hadn't been done before. And ever since then, I've walked into every meeting with a politician and sat down in front of them, knowing that I have the strength and support of 62% of Australia and counting behind me. And that, that is incredibly powerful. Um, especially when you think about the fact that, it, you know, around 15 years ago, um, most of the people that voted yes um, probably would have voted no. And it was the hard work of many people in the community working, um, people that were really on the margins of society um, and criminalised, um, then medicalised uh, over decades in this country that, that made this change happen. So I won't go back and do the, the really long historical piece, but I will tell you a bit about the YES campaign and how we um, made that happen. And essentially, at a really high level, it was a campaign made up of millions of conversations, like many campaigns we're talking about today, about real people and their lives. Um, we campaigned with the dignity and respect that we sought from the community. Um, it was a campaign of respectful conversations that sought to unite Australia, not divide us, to persuade. And we weren't aiming to beat anyone, but to win over everyone. Um, because we knew that after the vote, we'd all be living in the same Australia and we actually needed to move forward together as a nation, no voters and yes voters. And of course that change continues like any social issue really, that change continues today, tomorrow and the day after that. And of course that's why I've continued the work at Equality Australia to ensure that um, equality for LGBTIQ plus people is simply uh, a matter of course, a given, um, and hopefully one day it will be. And as to the mechanics of how, I think there's so many parallels with what's been already said. Uh, we did our research, we built a team, we set goals um, for the campaign in terms of turnout and the level of support. We smashed both of the goals that we set. Um, we got our messaging right early. We did our, we did our testing, um, we brought in expertise in-kind support, built donor relationships, and we built a really strong coalition for change because given the size of LGBTIQ plus communities, we weren't ever going to make up a majority of the population, but once you include uh, the people that we love, the people we work with, the people we play sport with, then we became all, also very powerful. And um, that stakeholder piece was really important. So building state and territory networks, different stakeholder streams, sport, corporates, faith, multicultural unions, civil society more broadly. And we told stories and helped people tell their own stories. Um, and together we had millions of conversations. Uh, we set up a tool to help people um, have conversations and made over a million phone calls using our phone, phone calling technology. Um, we stayed positive to stay the course and we focused on the messages, stories and conversations that would pers persuade. We didn't react to our opponents. Um, the, the, there's been talk of the difference it makes to have people in parliament. Certainly, I don't think we would have achieved marriage equality without, um, for the first time, having a, a, a really, um, you know, substantial number of uh, gay predominantly, no, we don't have any trans um, politicians yet, but LGB politicians, our Rainbow Caucus, um, that made an incredible difference. Uh, and it was really the Liberal Party um, gay MPs and allies like Warren Inch that were able to shift, um, shift the, the government on this. 
um, along with obviously really broad support across Labor, the Greens and um, other minor parties. Um, and, you know, as I said, obviously, the Yes campaign built on decades of resistance and advocacy by LGBTI people that came before it. But in terms of the scale of the campaign itself, it's it's probably the, or well, certainly the largest campaign I've worked on. We had um, at its peak 90 full-time staff, secondees and professional volunteers. Um, now that paled in comparison to the no side, like many, many of you um, have spoken about already. Uh, we were very much outmatched in terms of funds um, and we we now even more so because um, Equality Australia is a lot smaller than during uh, the marriage campaign. We've got five staff. Um, and, but what we, like the other campaigns, what we lacked in resources, we made up in people power. And uh, we have 15,000 volunteers across the country. We had hundreds of thousands of people door knocking, making phone calls, like I said, in some of the biggest field campaigning efforts you've ever seen. We had 900,000 new enrolments or updates to enrolments on the electoral roll as a result of um, our early efforts to mobilise people to update their details and a whole new army of campaigners and allies that stood up for us and that will keep fighting. And I can see, um, you know, through this conference today, you're really starting to build an army for this movement right now today, uh, which is which is really incredible. And I guess the last thing I wanted to say was that um, often there's a focus on law reform or particular moments in time, but um, a lot of social change is really sometimes undetectable. It's, it's slow, it's inevitable um, sort of shift in the fabric of our lives and one thread at a time, um, we change attitudes, we write laws, we, we change our behavior. And then you look back and, and realize that the weeks, months, and years of sort of tireless campaigning actually has created change um, that you couldn't have imagined. And uh, for the most part, I think change is made quietly through hard work, through the probably many of you on this um, call and this conference, the work you do every day, which doesn't hit the headlines, but progressively builds safer and more loving uh, and more inclusive communities. And that's that's the importance of the work undertaken by the organisations coming together today and the individuals on this call. So um, in, in closing, I guess, thank you for all of the work you do and I wish you all the best with your campaigns into the future. Thank you so much, Anna, and to Kirsten, Alistair and Kate for your insights. Um, it's really invaluable to hear for the audience to hear your experience and what you've worked and work, what's worked and what hasn't worked. Um, I'm going to go to some questions. Um, some of these are coming up through the chat as well, which is great. So to Kate, um, you mentioned that you have a really big coalition of housing and homelessness services and community sector organisations. And there's someone in the chat has mentioned this as well, that it's very, we have a very complex message Mm -hmm. um, to get across with all of the things around tax and, you know, the different options. How did you go about um, getting agreement across such a diverse range of people in focusing in on one or two key messages? Um, what were the challenges in refining that and the importance of having a message that we can all get behind? Uh, look, so we had a series of meetings with the sort of founding partners of the campaign and I, I can't pretend that there wasn't some sort of pretty robust conversations at some of those, you know, meetings. It's hard to all come to a point of agreement. But I think that what really drove people was that everyone wanted to see more social housing. And so it was about finding the points at which there was a lot of agreement and having to set aside some of the kill some of the darlings about what was not points of agreement. So for example, we say that we need more, um, 500,000 more social and affordable homes. We don't go to the detail of exactly how those be funded in terms of the funding mechanisms, because that's where some of the conflict within the sector um, would come about, like whether or not you, you have well, it's quite technical, like it's, you know, the, the business of sort of how government does funding, is it tax concessions, is it, you know, um, funding streams, is it direct capital grants, like all of that can kind of create some of those tensions. Um, and so we lost some of that detail, but to be honest, because it's a public facing campaign, 
those details can be really um, interesting for policy wonks behind the scenes when you're having the sort of lobbying conversations with government that the peak bodies still do, but those, they're not actually that interesting for the general public anyway, who, who want to see the product, not, it's like um, uh, in terms of, you know, you think of Ikea, like you don't, you don't sell people on the message by showing them the instruction manual for how you build the cabinet. You show them the beautiful picture of the cabinet. So our job is to um, sell the message about what a great um, outcome will be achieved for the nation if everyone's housed and there's more social housing, not, not that detail. Um, but I think that the main message I'd leave is that sometimes if there's points where you can't agree, those are the things that need to be um, put aside. Thanks, Kate. Um, I've got a question in the chat to, for you, Kirsten, if that's okay. Um, and this is about um, the value of different techniques, I guess. So what was the impact of the different types of advocacy? So going to the MPs, marginal seat campaigns, national media, um, paid advertising, what do you think was the best or are they all tools in the toolkit that we should all be using? What, what's your view on that? Um, I did see that um, uh, question in the chat and it made me smile because we didn't have money for any of those things. So um, I, uh, there were, in the early years of kind of the Every Australian Counts campaign, there was enough uh, money for a small team of people and it wasn't even, it was a national campaign, but there wasn't even enough money for a person in every state. So when I say small, I really do mean uh, small. So I, I uh, look enviously at Anna and her kind of team of kind of people because we had a very small group of people and we didn't have any money for advertising um, whatsoever at all. So it's funny, I get asked this question a lot, like what was the secret of kind of every Australian counts? And I find it a really funny kind of question because it was a bog standard community grassroots organising campaign. It started with the core people who were going to be affected by the change, which was people with disability and their families. And we started with them and we asked them to do things. And so it's just, it's the same way as campaigning usually works. It's ripples in a pond, starting with the people who are um, most affected by whatever it is that you, are, that you are campaigning on. And then asking them to, as Anna said, have conversations, tell stories, um, and build allies that way. So um, we started with this core group of, of people and we asked them to do things. And in terms of asking people to take actions, as kind of Kate said, we always have a sliding scale, um, particularly because we were working with a lot of people who'd never taken any kind of political kind of action before. And so we would have a sliding scale of things, the things that were really easy and simple to do and wouldn't take much time to things that were kind of much higher barrier and much kind of harder to do. So we'd have a sliding scale of that. We'd have a sliding scale of things um, uh, that, um, and this is sometimes where campaigns often get unstuck, we'd have a sliding scale of things that were really for people who were not used to taking any kind of action and were really like that, oh, I'm not really very political, but I do want to support the campaign, so I'll do this, versus what hardcore kind of activists and advocates kind of would do. And we would have a sliding scale of those kind of those kind of things. And this was really tricky for us because, and it's tricky in lots of campaigns, because the kinds of things that the hardcore kind of activists and advocates want to do, they aren't necessarily the same things that the kind of people who are not used to taking those kind of actions want to do. And it can be quite hard to kind of um, uh, keep a coalition of people together unless you have a sliding scale of things that people, different actions that people can take. Um, uh, and then we also just had a range of actions so you could find the thing that floated your boat. Um, and the other thing that we always tried to do is that things that you can do as an individual versus things that you can do in a group. Um, and so uh, when I hear about, advert, we didn't do any advertising. There wasn't a marginal seat campaign. We did a blanket go and see your MP campaign. And I think that that, and uh, in doing that, we provided, because we were dealing with people who had weren't used to going to see their MPs, we laid everything out for them. So they had everything at their fingertips that they needed to go and do those meetings. It was really, really, it was actually one of them, going to see an MP was one of the things that we did most successfully successfully um, and people look at it now and go wow that was really great at the beginning it was really really hard 
to get people to go and see their MPs. It's really striking to me how many people don't know who their local MP is and are kind of a bit scared to kind of go and see them. Um, and so we did everything to try and make it easy. We had how you find who your local MP is. We had scripts that they could um, use to kind of for the meetings. We had videos to show you how to do it. We had guides, we had leave behind material, everything to try and make it as possible. And if you wanna kind of hear about the impact of those meetings, um, if you watch YouTube, you can see the kind of number of MPs who stood in support of the legislation for the NDIS. And two, um, honestly to their eternal shame some of those people had never met a person with disability or a family member in their electorate before and having someone come into their office and explain in a very simple way what their life was like now and the kind of challenges they had every day but what it could be like under the NDIS it was those stories and those meetings that really built the political support for the NDIS. Thanks, Kirsten. And I think that reflects what the political panel was saying earlier about the importance of hearing from people with a lived experience and hearing stories um, and don't underestimate the power of meeting with your MP. Um, we will certainly be connecting up with people in the chat that are asking where to from here. Um, after this event, there'll be a link to um, a letter writing campaign, but also we're very keen, particularly in the lead up, to the federal election to work with Kate on the Everybody's Home campaign in targeting some of those MPs. So um, we will certainly be wanting to continue this. Anna, I'm now going to go to you, if that's okay. Um, you mentioned that you built up support from people that didn't agree with you, as well as people who did agree with you um, during your campaign. Would you be able to tell us about the importance of, you know, building coalitions across the divide um, and the importance of allies and also if you've got time the pros and cons of using corporations and celebrities to to raise the profile um, how how was the everybody's campaign i'm sorry the uh, marriage equality campaign able to use those tools yeah um well first of all our campaign was quite different to many others in that it was urgent it was happening whether we liked it or not so that level of urgency doesn't come about very often. Often in a campaign, you're trying to create the sense of urgency. Um, but there was no question the whole nation, you know, was voting and it was on whether we liked it or not. Um, that was quite helpful in terms of mobilising support. But it also meant that a lot of people were panicking and also a lot of people were in, within our tent. And about, I'd say, 25% of our leadership team's time was sort of spent dealing with friendly offers of assistance and strategic advice and complaints. Um, and then also uh, people were, were also disengaging. We were quite conscious that members of the public were sick of talking about marriage equality. They were hearing about it a lot and we were, you know, dealing with fatigue um, on the issue. Um, but to answer the last part of your question first, uh, we were very conscious and Tim Gartrell, who was our political director um, for the, for the, for the plebiscite part of the campaign, he uh, was very strong on this. He said it had to be a campaign of everyday Australians. So we kept getting told, you need to get this celebrity or that celebrity. And yes, we did end up getting some high profile Australians um, and Colin Minogue and Magda Zabanski and wonderful people like that um, did, did um, speak out for the campaign, but it, it couldn't be too heavily dominated by the elite. It couldn't be seen as a corporate campaign. It had to be a grassroots community campaign because that's, that's first of all, that's what we were and that's um, how we were going to persuade everyday people that this, this was an everyday issue affecting everyday people. Um, and LGBTI people were just like everyone else. And uh, we also were a little different to other campaigns, I think, because... We were trying to, it was essentially a get out the vote campaign. We knew that we had uh, about, you know, a really um, solid 25% hard yes, 25% hard no, and then this big movable middle. And it was that movable middle we needed to persuade. And it was the hard yeses we needed to use to try and persuade them to vote. The 25% that didn't like us, we didn't really want them to vote, um, obviously, but they were usually they were pretty uh, rusted on and, and felt quite passionately about expressing their no vote. So it was a bit of a different campaign and um, certainly uh, getting people out to vote was a, 
was, you know, you do that in America, right? You don't ever have to do that in Australia. It was quite, it was quite interesting. Um, so in that way, it wasn't traditional. And then um, the first part of your question about convincing people is, um, you know, you just, I, you just have to engage in conversation. And my tip is always keep it respectful. If someone doesn't agree with you, you're never gonna convince um, someone of your view by telling them they're a bigot, um, but you can, you can keep talking to them and you can keep opening up that pathway for connection, for um, finding common ground and for them slowly, hopefully starting to see the humanity in LGBTI people, despite our differences. And, um, you know, obviously amplifying the voices of queer people of faith and um, really important illustrations that it's not a choice between being religious and being gay. In fact, um, you can be one and the same and it's not a conflict at all. So, so it's those more nuanced conversations about faith and culture that we're having now, I think, um, post-marriage equality, which was much more of a short, sharp civil change. We now want to make sure that every LGBTI person out there is supported and included in their community and they don't face conversion therapy, they don't get rejected from a homelessness shelter. And I will, will say on this, in, in this forum, faith-based service providers can still lawfully discriminate against not just LGBTI people, but unmarried couples, single, single, um, single, people, single mothers um, uh, on the basis of pregnancy, breastfeeding status, these are our laws right now, and there's currently a campaign trying to change that. And I might even put a link to the petition in the chat box, um, so I won't miss that opportunity. Yeah, and there's also a request um, for the Building Better Homes campaign, particularly in those three states where the state ministers have decided not to adopt the National Building Code. So, Alistair, feel free to sure. jump in with that I'll link. Sure, I'll do that. Yeah, and I was actually about, we've only got a couple more minutes to go, so I was just going to quickly go to you, Alastair, about you mentioned seizing the moment. Um, how did you how did you go about, um, you know, very quickly recognising that this was a place, a decision makers meeting where you could potentially make a difference? How did you go about doing that? Um, well, it wasn't really me that came to that realisation, to be fair. It was, <laughs> it was people who'd been involved in the campaign earlier, um, people from Anood, um, uh, Bruce from the uh, Bruce Bonahady from the Melbourne Disability Institute, and and Di Winkler from the Summer Foundation, and others, who really sort of thought saw that ten years of hard work was coming to a point where we needed to have some pointed, some more pointed campaigning if we were going to get it over the line. And in fact, we kicked off the formal campaign only five months before that that um, that meeting which was a difficult task, but um, had, had they not taken that opportunity and seized that moment, um, the opportunity would have passed and it would be another three years before building ministers even consider it, which would put it, you know, another four or five years before um, you'd get any realistic change. So it is important that when you see those moments, you grab them because they don't come along every day. And, um, and if you miss them, there can be some consequences. Thank you so much. That's um that's great. And I think we're just about out of time for our panel. So um, as we're wrapping up and going back into the main room, um, I'd just like to quickly summarize some of the insights that you've um that you've put out. So there seems to be a, a very big um emphasis on the importance of partnerships and alliances and building that grassroots community. The, um, the importance of high profile people are, is there, particularly in um, reducing stigma and raising awareness, but it's really the grassroots conversations of ordinary people that are making the difference. Um, that it's important to have a range of options from very full on activism to very sort of small things that people can do in their own personal lives to discuss the issues. And that is very, um, very good to, good to have those options is really great. Not all of us have the ability to go and meet MPs or, or picket parliament. So it's great to have a range of options. Um, and that um, money isn't everything. Um, what we lack in money, we make up for in passion and ability to connect with each other. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody today for their incredible insights. 
we will be putting some um, some links in the chat at the end of this, and you are welcome to jump onto our House on Fire forum, which is a place for people to continue this discussion. There is a link to a letter that will um, go to your local federal and state MPs about the importance of acting now um, for older women and homelessness, not waiting for younger women now to be able to have more superannuation, but what do we do about our older women who are facing homelessness right Right now um, and there's also um, other options there on how to connect with the people in this chat um, we will also be sharing these videos and sharing the saved chat from the events as well so thank you again to our panelists um, Kate Colvin um, Alistair um, Kirsten and um, Anna Brown awesome discussion and um, thank you again to all of our participants for your fantastic questions and participation as well Thank you. Thanks, everyone.